Okay, well, very good to see uh, folks gathered here today, and thank you for joining us for this session, uh, uh, which um, is on soft power to strategic alignment, the challenges of the two Koreas and their global implications. Uh, my name is Rana Mitter. I'm the ST Lee Chair in US Asia Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School, and have a tremendous interest in Korea. And for that reason, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, uh, Dr. Yena Kwan is uh, a journalist. She uh, operates across continents, uh, as well as being, of course, an expert and very much someone who has worked frequently in, in Korea. She is also uh, German and has worked for ZDF and WDR, amongst other significant media organizations. She is spending the current uh, year at the Weatherhead Center um, as a visiting fellow and is engaged in a politics which, uh, in a project which is exploring uh, Korea's place in the wider geopolitical context. We're going to hear some of that today. So it's a pleasure to welcome Yena here. And what I'm going to do is ask Yena if you would give us uh, a talk, uh, which will probably be about sort of 35, 40 minutes, something like that. And then we'll turn to Q&A, and uh, we look forward to a discussion of this important uh, topic. So welcome, and please do uh, uh, take, the, uh, take the floor. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much, Professor Mitter, uh, for this kind introduction. Um, I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the Harvard Asia Center family and also our co-sponsor, the Korea Institute, for this um, yeah, amazing opportunity to share my thoughts on Korea and also to draw a bridge uh, from Hallyu to Kim Jong-un's ties with Putin in the same presentation. Um, but before I dive in, um, let's zoom out for a minute and step back in time. I'm going to be very unconventional now and start off with a story. Um, be aware that uh, I'm a journalist after all. Um, so this is a story about a little girl who was born and raised in Cologne, a town of, um, in the northwest of Germany. Her parents are from South Korea. They had both come to Germany to follow their studies. And growing up in Germany uh, in the 1990s, the girl was often asked by her German friends where she was from. And she would say, my roots are South Korean. Um, where is that? In China, in Japan? So during these days, almost none of her friends in Germany had heard about Korea before. And fast forward to the present day. This girl is a grown-up woman. And she sometimes asks herself uh, whether she is living in a completely different universe. Not only does basically everyone know about Korea, but so many people are fascinated by Korean culture. And some people even seem crazy about the K-universe, as I call it. So you might have noticed already that this little girl from Germany was me. It is my story and the story of so many other children <coughs> from Korean immigrant families in the US, in Europe, and all over the world. And the reason why I'm starting off my presentation today with this personal story is to show you that this radical shift from a relatively small, poor, unknown country somewhere in Asia to one of the most popular and trending cultures of our time, this shift has really happened only in recent decades. And as a second generation Korean myself, it is pretty exceptional to live through these periods and to compare how Korea's image in the world and the global perception of Korea has changed. So I'm raising this question. What has happened in this relatively short period of time? While on the other side of the Korean peninsula, the Kim regime has been even more aggressively pursuing its military and nuclear ambitions. As a journalist from Germany, I'm regularly asked to report on either K-pop, because it's super popular, or on nuclear North Korea, because it's threatening. Two extremely different worlds, and it's hard to believe sometimes that these two worlds are only a few kilometers apart from each other. But for Korean people, obviously, this has been the paradoxical reality they've been living in for such a long time. 
This talk aims at giving you an overview of the key asymmetric developments, emphasizing the deepening divisions and the huge disparity between the two Koreas. One Korea, which has become a globally acknowledged soft superpower, exporting K-culture around the globe and growing internationally. And the other Korea, a sealed off communist regime, trying to prevent any form of outside information coming in. A systemic abuser of human rights, remain, remaining fixated on the pursuit of military might. With this dual focus, I will couple both sides, soft power and geopolitics. So this is my outline. First, I'm going to talk about the concept of soft power in South Korea, which has become a global cultural powerhouse. And I want to point out that when talking about Hallyu in this presentation, I'm not really explaining why K-pop or K-drama is so popular. Today, I'm more interested in the political dimension of Hallyu, in Hallyu policy, and why soft power matters a lot. Then I will address the illicit flow of uh, South Korean popular culture into North Korea before focusing on hard power and the developments since Russia's invasion against Ukraine. I will also draw an analogy between soft hard power and alliances, arguing that behind soft power lie hard power motives. And in the third part, I'm going to refer to the upcoming US presidential election in November, embracing the hypothetical question, what if Trump wins? What would Trump's victory mean for the policies in Seoul and Pyongyang? So it is almost impossible to not talk about South Korea nowadays without talking about soft power. A concept that the political scientist and Harvard professor, Professor Joseph Nye, has coined. He called soft power the ability to affect others by attraction and persuasion rather than just coercion and payment. This is not just an academic theory explaining all of this. It is a powerful concept which had a strong impact on South Korea. Hallyu, the Korean cultural wave spanning from music, film, television, fashion to food, has swept across the world. It is South Korea's biggest expression of soft power that engages in a global audience and transforms the ways in which people view Korean culture and Korea as a nation. Even art museums nowadays are taking on the Korea hype, like this Hallyu exhibition in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which was opened just last week. So this is an exhibition originally Behind the success of South Korean cultural exports lies a very strong political strategy to make Korea big. It is hugely intentional, a highly calculated sector in the government, and of course, Hallyu was not an overnight success. So when did it all begin? For many non-Koreans, it all probably started off with BTS and Blackpink or Parasite and Squid Game. But in fact, it all began before that, even before the Gangnam style, which most of you will remember. It's hard to really pinpoint one moment or one event that triggered off the Korean wave, but then people want to have a date for the history books. So one could say that it already began in the late 1990s under former president Kim Dae-jung, who put a lot of effort in strengthening regional cooperation in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis. But generally speaking, one can say that the year 2002 was a very decisive year for South Korea. The year of the Football World Cup co-hosted by South Korea and Japan, a huge opportunity to promote Korean culture and cooperate with a neighboring country, Japan, as you might know, has been a rival for Korea since basically forever. 
So 2002 was also the year when South Korean singer Boa took off in Japan, a key market in Asia, and became one of the first Hallyu stars. Um, Japanese people gradually began uh, showing interest for K-pop and also for Korea as a country. And this is really just a really super short summary of how Hallyu got started and how the global consumption of South Korean culture has been on a constant rise. So why does South Korea care so much about soft power? First of all, it drives tourism and consumption especially through K-pop and its fans. Hallyu has hugely contributed to economic growth. According to the 2022 Global Hallyu Status, which is an annual report by the Korea Foundation and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there are about 178 million Hallyu fans around the globe. That's an 18-fold increase since 2012. And according to a 2019 study by the Korea Foundation, the overseas market for the South Korean pop culture industry doubled from 5.7 billion US dollars in 2015 to 10 billion US dollars in 2019. So the creative, uh, creative industry in South Korea generates billions and billions of money. So much money that the former South Korean president Moon Jae-in even awarded the group members of BTS the title of special cultural envoys due to their potential for generating income for the country. According to the Hyundai Research Institute, the group was contributing an estimated 3.5 billion US dollars annually to the nation's economy by 2020. So it would not be an exaggeration to speak of the BTS effect. And even though the chances that you'll run into one of the members of BTS in Korea are not particularly high, young people do want to travel to South Korea and explore the country and eat the food and wear the fashion that their stars are wearing. In 2023, almost 4 million of all foreign tourists were aged 30 or younger. But even I know so many people who are older than 30 uh, who discover their passion for Korea and want to travel there one day. Hallyu has recently really become one of the top policy priorities for South Korea, which has invested heavily in the creative industry and in the expansion of innovative K-content. Last November, the Ministry of Culture came up with a very ambitious plan to increase Hallyu expansion. Within the next five years, they want to create a government fund worth 745 million US dollars in order to help the video content industry produce, as they call it, killer content and to enhance the global competitiveness of the industry even more. And in February this year, it announced that it will provide a record number of 1.31 billion US dollars in policy financing to boost Korea's competitive position on the global market. So the bigger the success, the more political it gets. K-pop idols nowadays seem to be the most influential ambassadors of our time, be it the girl group Blackpink at the Buckingham Palace in London, becoming honorary members of the Order of the British Empire, together with uh, President Yoon Song yeol last November, the K-pop idol group Blackpink was awarded at the suggestion of the British government for the group's environmental advocacy. Or BTS in 2021, when the members went to the UN General Assembly with the former President Moon, delivering a seven-minute speech and performing permission to dance. Oh, and of course, they also met President Joe Biden. Such a huge PR moment for K-pop. Of course, there are many external factors which have driven Hallyu forward, like social media, obviously, and one big booster was indeed the COVID pandemic, which in the first place attacked global economy, including the South Korean market. But at the same time, it was a huge momentum for Hallyu because people around the globe had time. We had lots of time to stream K-dramas or K-movies. And those two to three years were highly beneficial for Hallyu 
especially in terms of reaching a global audience and not only Asian countries. In 2021, the South Korean series Squid Game on Netflix achieved 63 million hours of viewing in just two days during its debut week. And speaking of Netflix, on February 17 of this year, so just a few weeks ago, in fact, South Korean President Yoon Song yeol held a meeting with Netflix co-CEO Ted Sarandos and Squid Game star Lee Jong Jae at his presidential residence. And President Yoon called for increased investment in K-contents and what he calls the cultural alliance between the U.S. and South Korea. It was, in fact, already their second meeting during um, President Yoon's visit, state visit to Washington last year. So Rondo said Netflix would invest 2.5 billion U.S. dollars in South Korea over the next four years to produce Korean TV series and movies. President Yoon compared the relations between Netflix and Korea, Korean content companies to the political alliance, saying the Rock US alliance is an alliance of values that protects freedom, but culture is a prerequisite to protecting and expanding freedom. Soft power has really become one of the most important weapons for South Korea. When President Yoon Song yeol visited the US in 2023, he gave a speech at the Harvard Kennedy School, moderated by the godfather of soft power himself, Professor Joseph Nye, a truly symbolic picture displaying how much the South Korean president actually cares about soft power. But in fact, this is not even the moment that the majority of people will remember. It's a singing session at the White House, shared all over the world. A long time ago. So his singing skills might have been that crucial for the but it was a while. Awesome. Defined by mutual security and defense interests. This, I would personally call a smart power move, transporting the clear heart power message. The US and South Korea stand together as strong military partners, as close friends who have just implemented the Washington Declaration last year in order to step up nuclear deterrence against North Korea. A message which, of course, is clearly directed towards North Korea. South Korean popular culture has had a huge impact globally, and this does not, of course, exclude its closest neighbor, North Korea. In fact, K-drama, K-pop, is extremely widespread in North Korea, which seems to be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, existential threat to the North Korean regime. It's an open secret that basically everyone in North Korea enjoys it, including government officials and including Kim Jong-un himself. Back in 2018, after the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, Kim Jong-un invited South Korean musicians and K-pop artists to Pyongyang and even confessed to be a fan of the girl group Red Velvet himself. But today, six years later, he talks completely differently about K-culture, labeling K-pop as a vicious cancer corrupting the youth of his country. Squid Game, according to North Korean propaganda, shows the rotten society of South Korea. And when the very famous TV series Crash Landing on You turned out to be a mega hit, they would criticize the fact that the series shows poor and hungry North Koreans as well as corrupt politicians. What boosts South Korean popularity globally threatens the communist ideology of the North Korean regime. What is fun entertainment to the rest of the world is a true enemy for the North Korean state. But even in North Korea, complete censorship seems to be impossible. Even in the most isolated country in the world, K-pop and K-drama have entered the households of many North Koreans 
According to several surveys, more than 80% of North Koreans are consuming South Korean popular culture. How does the content get into North Korea? Well, we know from defectors uh, living in China or in South Korea that had been interviewed that Changmadang, the formerly illegal black market along the Chinese border, has played a decisive role. Due to the Great Famine in the mid-1990s, people were starving to death, so they had to find ways to survive. Um, and that's how this illegal market was created. All sorts of goods, including South Korean K-drama or K-pop music, were traded illegally into North Korea, mostly shared on USB sticks among family and close friends. But since 2018, Kim Jong-un himself officially recognized the market and collects money. So the so-called Changmadang generation, young people that didn't really experience the communist distribution system, they pretty much grew up with South Korean popular culture. And they also grew up with it, consuming it in secret. Because they risked their lives for doing that. North Korea, obviously, is a highly totalitarian state, which punishes people for all sorts of things. Among many is consuming foreign media, which is highly forbidden. In 2020, the North Korean regime passed a law. According to this law, people who distribute and consume foreign media will be punished. If you are caught, you have to go to jail. And sometimes they would even execute people in public in order to send out a clear message. But that somehow doesn't keep people away from doing it. Many of them are confident that even if they get caught, they can free themselves out of danger through bribery. The draconian measures cannot deter North Koreans from taking the risk. Because especially through the world of K-dramas, North Koreans can escape from their everyday lives. And through those fun stories, and not just movies about the state and Kim Jong-un, they get a glimpse of the South Korean society, of the world beyond North Korea, and of capitalism. While the North Korean state propagates that South Korea is poor and full of homeless people, the K-dramas, of course, show something else. This has had a huge impact on the North Korean society. But interestingly enough, not necessarily as we might assume in the sense of changing their political attitude. Most of the defectors say that their escape was economically motivated and not politically. A lot of women, especially, who watch K-dramas feel inspired to follow their own dreams of economic freedom. And that's why they leave their families and cross the Chinese border. The influence of South Korean popular culture on North Korea is one way to look at the soft power issue. But I was wondering, does anything like North Korean soft power exist? Well, if you directly compare democratic South Korea with the communist regime, you will come to the fast conclusion that it's almost impossible to compare. But sometimes, <coughs> North Korea launches one of their own charm offensives to raise global awareness. For example, by sending North Korean cheerleaders to the PyeongChang Winter Olympic Games in 2018. South Korean and North Korean athletes entering hand in hand under one flag of unification, having one Korean female ice hockey team. The Kim Jong-un had to approve all of this. Or is it showing his 10-year-old daughter Kim Jue at a nuclear launch? <laughs> Keeping a big mystery around the question who Kim Jong-un's successor will be is one of North Korea's biggest power moves. These images are signaling that there's already the next generation of leaders in the Kim dynasty that will continue expanding nuclear weapons for its survival. And if you think about it for a moment, there is in a way a similarity concerning the key motivation of both Koreas. Both sides want to grow as a nation. They want to be respected by other countries. And they want to have a weapon so powerful that they will never be attacked again. But then, of course, 
The key difference is they use different methods to achieve this goal. While South Korea has, has primarily expanded its soft power and maintained the ROC-US alliance for seven decades, North Korea has continuously enhanced its arsenal of weapons. The diversification of its missiles, which shall be launched faster and be more difficult to locate. The South Korean government keeps investing in Korean contents while North Korea is investing heavily in nuclear technology. According to their own information, North Korea is investing 20% of their state budget into the military buildup. And until today, North Korea has tested more than 220 missiles in total. It's hard military power they want to grow, with the ultimate goal to be officially accepted as a nuclear state with ICBM capability to reach the U.S. Since 2021, we've been observing accelerated military modernization. And 2022, if you might remember, was the year with a record number of missile tests, more than 90 in total. Last year, we counted at least 36 missiles, uh, missile tests, including five ICBM tests. Parallel to its military expansion, the strategic importance of Russia and China has grown for North Korea even more. Prioritizing a renewal of relations with Vladimir Putin. I would say welcome to the bromance between two autocratic leaders who have been isolated from the international community. They align in their worldview and they have become business partners. Most importantly, North Korea is clearly profiting from Russia's war against Ukraine, providing Russia with weapons and ammunition. It is exporting military equipment, selling artilleries, ballistic short-range missiles, and launch vehicles to Russia. After Iran, North Korea has become Russia's second most important alliance partner in the war against Ukraine, which has offered North Korea a huge opportunity to expand its foreign policy leeway. Military ties between Russia and North Korea have clearly deepened. In July 2023, North Korea tested an ICBM of the type Hwasong-18, which, according to the former National Security Advisor Kim Song-an, is practically identical with the Russia missile type SS-27. This shows that both countries have already cooperated in the field of weapon technology. According to analysts, North Korea might have received support from Russia from Russian rocket scientists. And investigative researchers from the British organization Conflict Armament Research that investigate supply chains of arms deliveries on behalf of governments have, support, have reported that Russia fired at least 24 North Korean ballistic missiles of the relatively new type KN-23 and KN-24 on seven Ukrainian battlefields. This picture shows uh, a missile type of KN-24. Half of them launched between the end of December last year until the beginning of February of this year. Apparently, around 75% of electronic missile components were produced in the US and Europe over the last three years. According to the think tank CSIS and Beyond Peril satellite imagery, North Korea sent more than 2.5 million artillery shells to Russia until the beginning of February. This is almost the entire amount of shells that the US, uh, that the EU has promised to Ukraine, but which has only partially arrived until now. And through this military cooperation, North Korea has received thousands of containers with food and fuel assistance, but also military knowledge and possibly even nuclear powered submarines. In return for weapons, Russia is providing Kim's regime military satellite technology. This exchange of knowledge is creating dangerous synergies. Last year, North Korea launched three, satellite, three satellites. The first two attempts in May and in August failed, but the third one in November succeeded. And this came shortly after Kim Jong-un's visit to Russia in September 2023. Together with Vladimir Putin, Kim Jong-un visited the Vostochny Cosmodrome, Russia's most modern spaceport, 
a highly symbolic meeting, clearly showing what Kim Jong-un wants in return for his weapons. He wants to enhance North Korea's military satellite capability because it would give North Korea real-time information about U.S. and South Korean military activities on the Korean Peninsula. The Axis Moscow and Pyongyang is a huge concern for the entire world. North Korea seems to, be, seems to successfully evade UN sanctions against ballistic missiles. And by accepting weapons from North Korea, Russia itself has been assisting Kim's regime in violating UN resolutions, even though being a member of the UN Security Council itself and having supported punitive actions against North Korea in the past. North Korea's reorientation towards closer cooperation um, goes hand in hand with a shift in tone towards South Korea. In January 2024, so at the beginning of this year, Kim Jong-un gave the order to destroy this 25 meter high monument in Pyongyang. It's called the Arch of Reunification. It was built in 2001, showing a woman from the north and a woman from the south representing hope for peaceful reunification. Moreover, three organizations in North Korea which were responsible for inter-Korean rapprochement were abolished too. In a speech on January 15, 2024, Kim Jong-un described South Korea as a principal enemy and said that the danger of a war had increased. Quote, South Korea is our nearest neighbor and has been judged as the most hostile state. Tension in the region is rising due to the U.S.-led escalation of military tensions. The possibility of a physical war has dramatically increased. Moreover, he emphasized that there would be no hope for a reunification anymore, that he would not negotiate about his nuclear weapons anymore. The speech gave reason to some Korea observers to come to the conclusion that North Korea is actually preparing for war which, in my opinion, is a very radical conclusion, given the fact that North Korea has often used threatening rhetoric in the past. Even though Kim Jong-un says right now that they reject reunification, we don't know exactly if they literally mean it or if they're simply unwilling to discuss reunification under the current South Korean administration and waiting for the moment to come when they feel that they have a better negotiation partner on the other side of Korea. But what is indeed very striking is the fact that Kim Jong-un has dropped North Korea's decades-old goal of reunification with the South, at least from a rhetoric point of view. While his father and grandfather still said they would try normalize relations to the US, any negotiations with the US and South Korea seem extremely unlikely under the current circumstances. Which leads me to the present day and the final part of my presentation, 2024, the year of several elections, especially the US presidential election. The potential of a return to the White House of Donald Trump has unnerved several states, especially close allies like South Korea, who are deeply troubled by his unpredictable approach to foreign policy. So the big elephant in the room is indeed the question, what if Trump wins? In South Korea's case, this question immediately involves the second question, whether the US would withdraw its 28,500 troops from South Korea if Trump gets reelected. During his presidency, Donald Trump had accused South Korea of free riding on US military power, calling for an end to the so-called expensive war games and demanding Seoul to pay 5 billion US dollars a year. This would be a five-fold increase. In a recent interview with KBS, Unification Minister Kim Jong-un recently emphasized that the United States is unlikely to cut back its forces in South Korea, even if former President Donald Trump gets re-elected. As, and that's his explanation, the US Congress had already decided the matter in a recent defense bill. According to the National Defense Authorization Act, the U.S. administration requires congressional approval to scale back all the U.S. troops from South Korea. 
This is South Korea's official position. But of course, the head of state in the U.S. will have a major impact on the U.S.-South Korea lines. Any form of escalation in the debate whether the U.S. should withdraw all its forces from South Korea and also Japan would have a huge effect. Once Russia and China sense any hesitation in the U.S. government and the U.S. commitment for collective defense, the deterrent power of alliances could decrease. South Korea will, of course, have to work with any government in the U.S., whether under Trump or Biden, but it is highly doubtful whether the alliance can remain completely unchanged because of solid support from the U.S. Congress. Of course, all U.S. allies will closely follow the campaign in the next few months, and for the current Yoon government, Biden would be the desired president, in my opinion. But the mere fact that Trump is running for office again has already put the South Korean government under pressure. It has already initiated an early start of defense cost sharing talks with the U.S., almost two years before the expiration of the current special measures agreement, the so-called SMA, which regulates how the two sides split the bill for keeping the American troops stationed in South Korea. Since 1991, the SMA, the Special Measures Agreement, is renewed every two to six years. And the current SMA was signed in April 2021 after Joe Biden won in the 2020 U.S. presidential election. And the unusually early start of negotiations now reflects South Korean concerns that if Trump wins, the cost-sharing issue could become a major conflict between the allies <clears throat> And under the current scenario, some people even say that South Korea is running a race against the inauguration clock. If Trump wins in November, Seoul will likely seek to conclude the talks before he is sworn in in January 2025. And if Trump loses in November, they will probably have more time to negotiate greater concessions from President Joe Biden. But Trump's tough stance on defense cost sharing is not the only concern. There are deep concerns that he might not share South Korea's threat perception. How will Trump deal with North Korean nuclear issues? So far, Yoon's policies have been closely aligned with those of the Biden administration. And if Trump wins and tries to unilaterally improve relations with Kim Jong-un, this would run contrary to Seoul's North Korea policy strategy. And such a scenario could create friction with the UN administration and more so with the overall US-South Korea alliance. And inside South Korea, this would stir debates around the question whether it should enhance its defense capabilities or even go nuclear. And what is North Korea's point of view? Well, North Korea is certainly waiting out the election in November while fostering the renewed cooperation with Russia. But one might say that Donald Trump would be more favorable for Kim Jong-un's interests. He met Kim Jong-un three times during his time in office. In 2018, Trump announced that the U.S. military would stop joint military exercises on the Korean Peninsula. And he was also the only American president so far who introduced the idea of withdrawing the U.S. troops from South Korea. Although the 2019 Trump-Kim summit in Hanoi, Vietnam, did not turn out to be a success, the North Korean leader probably thinks that a victory by Donald Trump would give him another chance for resuming negotiations. In Pyongyang's view, the current U.S.-South Korean policy toward North Korea is much worse than Trump's North Korea policy. President Biden and South Korean president agreed to restart the joint military exercises. They have strengthened the U.S.-South Korea U.S. alliance. And also with the Camp David summit agreement last year, they even included Japan in a trilateral cooperation, primarily to counter North Korea. Trump seems to be more amenable to North Korean interests, and he would possibly create a rift in the biden yoon bromance and weaken not only the alliance between South Korea and the United States, but even challenge the strength and trilateral ties with Kishida, which is exactly what North Korea favors. Until the U.S. elections in November, 
North Korea will most likely to continue to increase tensions with South Korea and the U.S. Uh, because from Pyongyang's point of view, the more they increase tensions now, the more they can scale back during negotiations, negotiations with Trump in case he becomes president. And Trump, again, would most definitely see this as his personal success to provide peace. And the ultimate goal of North Korea would be to reach an agreement this time, unlike in Hanoi. So let me conclude my talk about Korea. From past experiences, North Korean provocations have sometimes created windows of opportunity to restart diplomacy with the United States. But this is not really likely to happen given the negative signal sent by North Korea. So under these circumstances, tensions on the Korean Peninsula have intensified for the last few years and will probably intensify even more during the U.S. election year. And there is little to no prospect of inter-Korean dialogue. I've chosen this picture from the very famous uh, TV series that you might know, Crash Landing on You, as a metaphor. The two Koreas remain so close and yet so far away. While South Korea has become a powerful player on the global stage and a soft superpower that keeps expanding its capabilities to attract and persuade, North Korea, on the other hand, is a pariah state, constantly fixated on its hard power alliances. They don't <coughs> align in power interests at all, nor in political alliances. North Korea's international isolation and expanded collaboration with Russia are the ultimate forms of misalignment between the two Koreas. The core fear of the regime, of the North Korean regime, is a US-led reunification by absorption. But in fact, for the majority of the South Koreans nowadays, the mere idea of a unified country seems highly, highly unrealistic. A love story like in Crash Landing on You, which might feel really good on screen, is certainly not in the paradoxical reality they've been living in for such a long time. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm really looking forward to a Q&A session. I would also like to invite you to ask Professor Mitter questions as well, because he's an expert on US-Asia relations. Thank you very much. You know, thank you very much indeed for a fascinating talk, which took in both halves of the peninsula with great um, understanding and range. Uh, a lot of fascinating things that we could bring up, and I hope we'll be in conversation also uh, between ourselves and also in the room. Um, I was very pleased when you mentioned the 2002 um, World Cup, because uh, I actually have, in fact, I may have had it this morning, somewhere still my uh, T-shirt from that particular uh, World Cup sequence. And I'm proud to say that I can just about still fit into the 2002 South Korea-Japan World Cup T-shirt that I have. <laughs> so that may be a sign that not everything has gone the wrong direction. Um, what I'd like to do, if I may, is just throw a couple of thoughts to you about the talk, and we might just go back and forth with that for a little bit. And then uh, there are various people here who I think probably have questions and comments about the talk, and I'd love to bring them in in just a minute or two. But let me uh, start off with a few um, thoughts. Um, let me start with the South, uh, if I may. I will try and bring them together, I think, over the course of the conversation. I find myself thinking actually sometimes about a comparison for South Korea, which I've seen at least some scholarly literature more and more talk about, which is not just the, the comparison with the North, which you've talked about, but actually the comparison with Taiwan, in the sense of being an East Asian state that emerges from an authoritarian system into something that is much broader, much more democratic, and actually has a very powerful soft power engagement with the with the wider uh, wider world. The difference being, of course, that South Korea is a recognized state and Taiwan has this anomalous status that we, we, we know about. But in terms of their domestic histories, there are genuine comparisons. And one of the things that strikes me about Taiwan's uh, definition of itself through culture is that in some ways it draws very actively 
on the traumas of the recent past. In other words, that Taiwan portrays itself as a democratic state, which these days, of course, it is, in some ways very actively in the context of its quite turbulent domestic politics during the Cold War under the dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek. Um, figures such as Ame, the Taiwanese uh, pop singer, who is actually of uh, indigenous Taiwanese Aboriginal background, has become a sort of symbol of all sorts of things that are uh, changing in identity politics in Taiwan, including uh, LGBTQ+, but also Aboriginal identity. And that's also had some significance in her presence in China as a, uh, um, a cultural figure. So I found myself wondering, is there any sense in which any of the Hallyu soft power you're talking about incorporates or engages with Korea's, South Korea's recent traumas. I mean, I, the point of comparison that came to me is the way in which um, uh, Taiwan's uh, uh, sort of original um, trauma in 1947 of uh, the uh, persecution and, and uh, murder of many political activists way back in the 1940s then came back to haunt Taiwan in the 1980s and 90s during the period of democratization. More recently, of course, uh, Guangzhou in 1980 was a scene of a massacre at the end of the Park government that still has political resonance. Is it meaningful to see any of that more difficult history in the way that Korea popularizes its culture, or do they sit in two separate silos, really? I think, uh, thank you so much for the, your perspectives and the question. Um, I think you really have to uh, differentiate between K-pop on the one hand and K-drama or K-movie on the other hand. I think um, I, I'm not really aware of any K-pop songs that would um, directly address those uh, traumatic issues or history issues. Mm. But I know several Korean dramas and Korean movies that would um, make this as a topic. Um, and one very famous um, TV series that I mentioned in my presentation is indeed Crash Landing in You, uh, which of course draws on the trauma of the separation between the North and the South. And it's interesting that this topic um, uh, really reaches not only the older generations uh, within South Korea, but even the younger generations. Mm. So this is kind of, I would say, the um, the dilemma sometimes um, to, on the one hand, uh, still uh, young people nowadays in South Korea, they still grow up with the awareness that um, they are technically still at war. Uh, we have, for example, also the... Um, uh, obligatory military service that all the young men still have to go through. And even after the military service, they have to stay reservists for eight years and go for trainings uh, once a year. So it is still very much aware. But of course, a challenge is that the past, uh, the very traumatic past that our grandpa uh, grandparents' generations experience, it of course uh, fades more and more. And uh, even though there are often provocations from the North, South Koreans have really, really get accustomed to living um, through this in everyday life. Mm. So I think it's still interesting that there are movies and TV series uh, that still draw on those traumas and that uh, still reaches young people as well. And we'll just quick follow up question on the North before we, we open up. I was just curious, I mean, this idea that actually uh, the younger generation in North Korea today is one that's grown up with the South Korean popular culture. What do we know, if anything, about the technicalities of how they access and view it? I mean, presumably it's not possible, or is it possible, to use uh, cyber techniques to get streaming services? So is it done on DVDs, or you know, how actually do you do this if you're going to do this in North Korea? Mm -hmm. So um, the challenge, of course, when you talk about North Korea is always uh, and I would really emphasize that we don't know 100% what's really going on in North Korea. So everyone who would uh, say that um, is, is not really serious about the topic. So we know from what the defectors mm. said um, in interviews, especially um, in Hanawon. Hanawon is um, a facility in South Korea that teaches North Korean defectors before they move on to the real world or to the society. And in those, um, Hanawon did several surveys and interviews. And 
asked, of course, the defectors uh, how it's possible to consume those products um, in this very isolated country. Right. And we know from then that um, they would often exchange uh, those products which are shared on USB sticks. Huh? So that was also my first thought. Do they do it on DVDs or on CDs or whatever, like we uh, used to do in the past? But it's uh, done uh, through the USB stick. And often, oftentimes it is uh, through um, exchanged. And uh, they would um, la get into North Korea through Changmadang, which I mentioned in my um, presentation. The black market. Exactly, the mm -hmm. black market. And it's interesting um, that it's so widespread. I was uh, surprised myself mm. when I uh, got to know about this many years ago, that uh, they would consume those products. And um, it's interesting also that they also do it uh, because they find apparently the South Korean accent very interesting. Yeah. Uh, for them, it's often very exotic and uh, some young people would try to imitate it. But of course, they have to be extremely careful But because even using the South Korean accent is forbidden in North Korea. And if you get caught at some point, you will also uh, have to go to jail in the worst case. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, you know, very, very fascinating insights um, there. Um, could we open up to the room here? Uh, any questions or comments that you have on the talk for uh, for Yena? Must have been Koreanists. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, I'm curious about what well, you mentioned about North Korean or oh, sorry, South Korean media being being consumed in. Uh, North Korea, because I feel like one of the long-standing questions about Korean reunification is if, uh, since North Korean and South Korean cultures have been separated for so long, if they can mesh together and create a cohesive society. Um, so I'm just wondering, would South Korean media, or as it is right now, would it be effective in, uh, I guess, if reunification ever happened in, mm -hmm. in helping create that bond? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think this is like a very um, normal assumption that we uh, would have, like if those North Korean people consume those products and they see capital South Korea, capitalist South Korea, and seeing how the people on the other side live so well, they're not hungry um, and they are a lot wealthier than themselves. Uh, would that not change their ideology automatically, like in a very um, uh, creative way. But it's very interesting also, again, from what we know from defectors' interviews, that most of um, the North Korean defectors who decided to come over to South Korea, they didn't do it because they believed South Korea is politically so much better than North Korea. In fact, it's surprising that um, service uh, from the Hanawon say that uh, around 50% of the North Korean defectors, they would still prefer North Korea, which is quite surprising because uh, they've come all the way to, to, so to the south along the Chinese border. And you also have to know that those people who risk their lives to, uh, to escape from North Korea, um, most of the people, they experience uh, human trafficking. So they come in search for freedom and they often, it's like the majority of, of those people who escape, they, I think it was more than 70% have experienced uh, human trafficking along the way. And still when they come to South Korea and they try to um, adjust to the new living standards, they would still say, I miss my old home country. So you can really sense that ideology, which they grew up from, when they were babies, uh, in fact, it's really, really deep in their minds. And it's not so easy to change with just one K-drama or just with one song. Other questions that want to? Yes. yes sir. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your own personal experiences. I find that really fascinating. I think this is quite interesting um, that um, it makes a huge difference if you uh, think about uh, North Koreans in the 60s, 70s, and nowadays. Um, and also the situation with the South as well, the difference between uh, the economic difference between South and North was not that huge back then. Whereas nowadays, of course, it's too extreme. Um, so I remember also a lot of um, German colleagues who were a bit older than me, who reported that they visited North Korea 
um, in the, I think they said in the 70s or 80s, and they went there for a holiday and they said it's a wonderful country with, with, with beaches. And I was quite surprised when I heard that because in my, in my mind, North Korea is completely isolated. No one can go into. Um, speaking about North Korean soft power, I think you cannot really c call it soft power when you compare it to so South Korean soft power. I would rather call it maybe a soft power attempts or a soft power experiments. When you, for example, when I um, I showed you the uh, Morambong, the cheerleaders uh, and the band. Um, these are, of course, North Koreans will definitely have their own pride of their own culture and of um, how of their own artists as well. Um, but I think North Korea has pretty much decided on put the emphasis not on expanding soft power, but rather um, hard power. And in my opinion, the main reason for that is for soft power, you need to be really, really open and you need to be open for cooperations. You need to be open for econo economic development um, to really expand your soft power skills and to really attract people into your country. Could I just um, follow up briefly on, on that thought, actually? Um, you know, because one of the subjects of uh, fascination to many, including in China, is China's relationship with North Korea. And I, you know, the probably the closest encounter in a literal sense that I've, well, I've had, I think, two close but not particularly uh, meaningful encounters. One was um, when I was a graduate student, there's a North Korean consulate in Shenyang in Northeast China, where I attempted to try and sort of, you know, have a look at some of the pictures that were stuck up outside, and they were very keen to not to encourage anyone to come and, come and do that. Um, but more recently in Beijing, I went to something which is a, a known phenomenon, which is restaurants that are essentially staffed by North Korean staff, mostly young women. Um, and managed, and you actually get South Korean uh, delicacies, including beer, there as uh, as well. Some of those restaurants have become uh, controversial because actually there are disputes about sort of employment contracts and so forth uh, uh, there as uh, as well. What what if anything do we know about that North Korea China relationship? And I suppose under that, this question is: Has anything changed significantly? Do you think in the recent past? I think um, alongside the strength and ties with Russia, uh, North Korea has recognized um, the importance, the, the strategic importance to even go deeper um, the ties with China. Mm -hmm. um, because these are countries, unlike South Korea or the US or Japan, um, that are like-minded. They can align in certain worldviews, and they definitely align in the alliance against the U.S. That's for sure. Um, however, I would say, um, yeah, like in terms of soft power, if you come back to that thing, I think it's easier for North Korea to attract and to lure people from those countries, Chinese people or uh, Russian people. Uh, for example, recently, um, North Korea opened up Again, um, tourism after a very harsh lockdown during the COVID pandemic. And the first people they let in uh, were only Russian tourists, uh, about 100, I guess. So this, again, is, of course, this shows that, yes, uh, North Korea is trying to uh, attract people, um, but uh, usually directed towards like-minded nations like Russia or China. Thanks very much, Jenna. That's great. Um, other questions that we have? Yes, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask you, um, how durable do you see the uh, South Korea and Japan co cooperation? Because, like, you know, um, uh, I remember President Yoon, when he came last year, he talked about how, like, he felt like um, South Korea had to move on and cooperate with Japan. But also, like, I'm interested to, you know, think about, like, you know, President Moon, before he, when he was president, he also went to... Uh, do a reparable Truman with North Korea. So I'm curious to hear like how you think, um, even though there's government alignment, like how like there could be like people to people alignment between the two countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's interesting because I, I actually wrote my um, PhD dissertation on South Korean Japan relations. So I'm always closely following uh, ties with uh, 
the neighbor country. So most of you will, of course, be aware that Japan, the relations between Japan and South Korea have been always very, very difficult um, due to the occupation past. And its um, fact is that uh, so many um, problems, conflicts deriving from this time have not been solved until today. And depending on who was or is in power in South Korea and Japan, the relations were either improving or uh, less improving. And um, under the current uh, president, uh, Yoon Song Yeol, um, relations with Japan have indeed uh, improved quite significantly. Um, and it is, of course, due to his uh, initiative to say that we should, well, South Korean government should um, pay reparations to the forced laborers um, who used to uh, work uh, in Japan during the occupation past. And this has, uh, on the one hand, uh, created a lot of trouble within South Korea because there is a huge uh, part within the country that would say uh, we should not give in and we should really wait until the very last day until Japan or the Japanese government is willing to uh, uh, to say sorry in a very uh, meaningful way and also to pay reparations officially. Um, but uh, President Yoon has decided to say uh, that uh, present uh, issues are more important uh, than past issues. And that's why he is willing, uh, or the, the South Korean government should be willing to pay um, instead and uh, improve relations with, uh, with Japan. Um, given the fact that uh, tensions are very high at the moment with North Korea, and also, of course, um, uh, US-Chinese relations, um, everyone, I think, would welcome, first of all, uh, good relations with Japan, because it strengthens also the alliance with the US in a trilateral way. However, I wonder um, whether in the future, uh, when a new president might come in, also in uh, Japan, a new prime minister, this could come up again. And this has been an ongoing conflict between those two countries. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really keen on um, observing the situation right there too. Really in terms of the Korean um, mm -hmm. peninsula, it seems to me that, I mean, you really talk about intensified tensions. You meant between yeah. the two Koreas, I think, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, is, is that something that you see intensifying, um, I mean, further? D during yeah, the I, I US did, election I mean, year? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I oh, would okay. assume that this you is do. going on because North Korea has just uh, realized how powerful uh, and beneficial uh, the uh, renewal of mm. corporations with Russia and China is and this of course is uh, absolutely uh, against South Korean interests. Mm -hmm. um, South Korea has pretty much aligned with the US uh, when it comes to, for example, Russia's war against Ukraine. So this is co completely asymmetrical. Um, uh, Kim Jong-un aligning with uh, the dictators, uh, the two dictators and South Korea aligning uh, even more with um, the US and also Europe in fact. Um, and also, I think uh, it's pretty uh, common what we see from the past that North Korea often uses this um, as a tool right. to intensify and to do more provocations during U.S. elections um, and also, uh, yeah, in front of elections anyway. And my guess is that uh, North Korea these days is fairly sure that China is not going to push in the direction of anything like unification uh, because it has relations with both Koreas, it has mm -hmm. uh, important economic uh, ties with South Korea, and there is no political interest in China in getting a reunified Korea that would not be essentially uh, a China-friendly state, and so they're unlikely to sponsor, I think, anything in that, that direction. So uh, I think we're unlikely to, to see that. I agree with you. <laughs> I think, well, on that note, really, that's great. Um, I think we have almost exhausted our time, so can we say thank you to all for coming, to you all for coming. Thanks for a fascinating talk uh, from Dr. Yena Kwan. And could we all thank her very much for that talk?